Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I want to look at Cubes OS. This is a release candidate. I think they're in the third one right now. So we're probably a couple of months, maybe, if we're lucky, away from the general release of this. If this holds true to what's happened in the past, and there's no, no, nobody knows, you know, how many release candidates it'll take. Some have taken four, some have taken five, some have taken three. So you never know. It just depends on how the testing goes and whether or not they're willing to live with any minor bugs this going forward. Their major bugs are going to stop and fix it, of course. But for those of you that don't know what Cubes is, let's talk about what that is first. Cubes, first of all, is a free and open source security-oriented system that is meant for single-user desktop computing environments. It is based on Linux, and it uses Zen as its architecture for uh, creating virtual machines. Cubes is based on the concept of isolated compartments, things that they call cubes. Uh, in, in my parlance, where in the Department of Defense, we called them enclaves. Same kind of thing. It's a separation of concerns. So you can see kind of the, uh, the overall design of cubes here. In the top left-hand corner, you have Zen. This is the like I said, this is the virtual machine manager. Below that, you have the administration VM. This is where you would create or delete or modify the existing cubes that you have on the system. Are you stuck with the ones that it comes with? No. Uh, there are instructions on the site to allow you to add things like uh, Ubuntu and Arch and Windows even. Uh, there's also the GUI VM. This came about in 4.0. It uh, permits them to move the graphics hardware into its own virtual machine so that resources can be shared among the different cubes that require a virtual machine to accelerate performance. In the middle tier, you have templates. So templates are the same thing as they would be in any virtual machine. Those are, I'm going to set up something I want to reuse going forward. So it, it's just like it says, it's a cookie cutter. And this is the template for the cookie cutter that, that will allow me to create as many virtual machines as I want from that template. Only I can modify each, each individual uh, virtual machine that's created what, and still maintain a centralized core in the template of the packages and configuration and hardening and all of that stuff you can do there, for example. The uh, app VMs are where you have not only your operating system that's built from the template, but you also have the ability to launch only particular applications uh, I'm on out of that virtual machine. Say like you only want Thunderbird or you want Firefox. VLC, or maybe you're using, you know, one of the uh, LibreOffice, uh, open office packages to do that. Below that, you have uh, some of them that are, the one in particular is called a Vault VM. Vault VMs have no connection to the outside world at all. And so these are good places to store keys, SSH keys, GPG keys, uh, your password. There's, next to that, you have your disposable virtual machine. And these are based around Hunix. And so this is a Tor environment uh, that allows you to stand up a, a Tor browser that you can then go and access untrusted sites. And they go through the Hunix gateway and out into the network uh, to allow you to attempt to do an anonymized uh, visit to a website without exposing your identity your IP address, or any private information about yourself uh, in order to be able to get information, to collect information on what you need to know. Once you've closed down that virtual machine, it, the, it self-destructs. All, all of the cookies, all of the files that you created in that virtual machine, you better have saved them off somewhere else if you want to use them but everything on that virtual machine is obliterated. It's gone. That's what they mean by disposable. 
In the third column at the top, you have the hardware VM. This is a SysUSB VM. SysUSB VM is, is a place where it allows you to define all of the USB devices that you want, have all the connections managed in a, a single virtual machine, and then you can parcel out individual um, individual elements of those USB devices. For example, if I have a YubiKey and I am attaching it to a USB hub that has other devices connected into it, keyboard, maybe a mouse, maybe some storage devices, I don't, I don't want to bring in the entire hub. I just want the YubiKey. That is how they allow you to do that, is that on your on your on your app VM, you can define which devices out of that VM gets moved over and used and leaves the rest of them inside of the, the sys USB. The same principle applies to uh, Wi-Fi and network cards as well. You can pull out individual ones that you want and those go into sysnet VM uh, to allow you to separate the network devices from your application VMs. Firewalls are maintained uh, on the next layer out, and, and those can control outbound or inbound uh, connections. Each I'm not going to debate whether a firewall is useful today or not. That's not the important part. The, as I'm just describing the architecture to you as the cube's uh, designers have built this. But each cube is implemented as a virtual machine, and it has a specific purpose. So you can define how you want that virtual machine to behave. The color coding is meant to provide a way of indication of, is this more trusted or less trusted or not trusted at all? So it allows you to, to establish degrees of trust and depict that to, to the user or the person using the system as a color. Black would be the most trusted uh, in your environment. So that would be things like DOM and your administrative VM. The next one up to gray would be your GUI VMs. And the reason for that is you have proprietary components there that we don't have source code in order to understand how those work. The template, again, would also be a more trusted but less trusted than, than the Zen virtual machine. So here... The, in the templates, you can go in and, and install packages that you need to be able to deploy to your application's VM. So you don't have a Fedora and a Debian for every security level here. It's simply Fedora and Debian, Hunix, whatever that you have in there, or even Windows can be installed in, as a template. When you create the application's VM, you define what color you want to use to depict it. So it's, the color doesn't set the security level. That's done by your configuration. So the color level is just a visual clue to you of, hey, this is the one I use for personal use. This one I use for work. I might color code that blue. This one I use as my... Uh, I want to be able to just go out and, and, and surf and look at stuff that's on the internet. And so uh, that might be my untrusted or red. Could be your social media accounts in there. Generally, though, the untrusted would be areas that you don't log into. So, yeah, those would be things that you're trying to maintain your identity, not, not, not expose it. So the nature of Cubes OS is it's a full-fledged, you can have full-fledged um, uh, templates or stripped-down templates uh, that are based on Debian or Fedora. There's uh, a Debian uh, template and a Debian minimal. There's a Fedora template and a Fedora minimal. So all windows are displayed in a unified desktop. So I have, <clears throat> I can see my personal, I can bring up applications in my personal environment. I can bring up applications in my work environment. I can work at them, work on them at the same time, and I'm confident because of the way that Cubes works is that there is no interaction between those virtual machines, uh, no place where they share data, no place where they're connected together. 
they are islands. And that's the reason why you have all of these superficial uh, VMs that sit on the outside that manage hardware and network, firewalls, all of those things for you. That's the reason for that, is to be able to maintain that, that separation between them. So that isolation uh, allows different pieces of the software uh, so maintain isolation from each other as well. So if I have a, a browser up in my personal window, the cookies can't flow over from my work environment and vice versa. Those, the, the cookies that are, that are saved in those virtual machines are only ones created by that virtual machine. They're not, there's nothing shared. Uh, and the same with any other pieces of information, data, or whatnot. Applications are the exception because that's the reason why you, you, you install those to the template, is those would be areas that you want to share with other uh, applications VMs. There, you can also create disposable VMs. We kind of touched on that on the fly, and then they will self-destruct automatically when you shut them down. Now, generally, you would probably want to do that. There's provisions already set up to allow you to set up an anonymous disposable VM or a persistent untrusted VM, since those sites you would generally consider to be untrusted. There's also, uh, we talked about the secure device isolation so there's four categories of devices that cubes will understand for device isolation. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, we kind of touched on it a little bit. I have a, I, I have a VM that I keep for my devices, uh, and those can be microphones, they can be block storage devices, they can be USB, can even be a PCIe device uh, that I need to be able to share. And those are maintained in isolation, and I choose when and where those devices are used. Pay attention, though, to uh, any caveats that you see in there, because it is very easy to skip a step or undo something that's critical to the security components that rely underneath. And you don't want to do that, otherwise you will open yourself up in ways that you aren't expecting. So anyway, that those are that's why the user guides are so important. And so the user guides that are inside of cubes, the first time you read through them, you might think, wow, this is really technical and heavy. And yes, it is. Uh, but, you know, I'm, uh, I don't know how to put this delicately. The You'll find the cubes people a little direct. Um, Maybe that's a good way of saying it. It, you know, they they're going to answer your question, but they're probably going to be a little direct. They might even they might even admonish you a little bit because if you haven't done your homework, haven't looked through the forums, you know, to see if that question has been answered. Now, if you just can't find it, say so. Hey, I've looked. I can't find the answer to this. Can somebody please tell me? Also, read the FAQ because a lot of the things that a lot of new users ask are in there. So, yeah, yeah. I think the uh, manual for, well, even for me, it gets a little deep sometimes because there's just some things that are just too deep and I don't really care about the implementation details. What I'm more interested in, what are the configuration things that I need to be paying attention to? So, but sometimes the manuals are written more heavily on the technical side than on the user side. That's the point I think I'm trying to make. So what about uh, UEFI and legacy boot? What about that? Well, you in 4.2, you have a unified Grub config, which supports both. So if you have a, a system that's using UEFI or you're one that's an older legacy BIOS, it should work. Now, I'm going to say should work. I ran into issues, and, and I will talk about those at the end, with the UEFI on my Lenovo. But uh, they their manual covered that aspect of that possibility, and so that was a big help. Pipewire is supported in 4.2, although I also ran into issues with that. And I know people are still running into issues with Pipewire. A couple other things that you might consider here is that 
What if you're what if you want to put this on a virtual machine? What if you just want to install it and kick it around and see what happens with it? It's not really meant for that. And the reason for that is Zen wants to be next to the hardware. Yeah, you might get it to run. Their the official position that I've read in the documentation is no, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Because you're you could compromise the security footprint of of Q. So my final thought. So let, let me do the positive ones first and take the negativity with a grain of salt because this is a release candidate after all. So the Cubes OS development team has, they made some vast improvements over the last three years with Cubes and all of them I think are in the, are spot on. Uh, yeah, maybe there's a few of them that are kind of, eh, well, why would you do that? But you know, they're they're really trying to make this a lot easier. I remember in the early days, it was like, oh, my God. Uh, and maybe it was just partly because I was unfamiliar with the Cubes environment and, and the color codes were throwing me off. The project also has, I think, a clear direction upon what they're trying to do, where they're planning on going. And it appears to me that they're executing on it. So the last time I did a video on 4.1.1, they were just starting to plan the GUI VM. Well, it's up. It's running. It's in 4.2. They've implemented it. So good on them. And then they've added Pipewire support for this. And that's, yeah, that's, if you've used Pipewire, you probably know what, exactly what I'm talking about, right? Uh, yeah, it can be good. It can be problematic. It can cause all kinds of weirdness. Uh, yeah, and, and it does it on its own. You don't have to do anything about to, to initiate it other than try to use it. So some of the things that I have found with using this release candidate. Now, take this with as large a grain of salt as a boulder, but because this is a release candidate and they're still testing and finding bugs. The first problem I ran into, I, well, I'm not going to talk about release candidate two, that's fixed. But in release candidate three, I have a ethernet card in the X1 extreme that Cubes absolutely hates. Now, I've never had any problem with running it with any of the Fedoras. I, I've had that machine since Fedora 36. It's always worked, but it does have a, a it, it is kind of a weird thing in that you have to have a dongle to plug it in in order to get the actual port visible on the outside. There, there was a whole long list of errors that it was generating. I've seen that on previous releases of Cubes because in the past they've always used Intel hardware, but this one is not. Taking that out, though, it, it comes right up and it works just fine. So, yeah, I mean, it's an easy fix. Just rip the PCI driver out of the, uh, of, out of the uh, definition and you're fine. The other thing I ran into was something really strange. So I was charging the laptop and I was done charging. And so I was going to pull the plug, pick it up and take off with the machine I didn't, you know, I do this all the time, so I don't even think about it. I just unplug it and then take off. Well, most laptops will, they'll reclock as soon as you unplug things. It's going to try to drop in power consumption. Even though I'm running unbalanced, it sometimes will drop things down lower in order to preserve the battery life. Well, when it did that, it sent cubes into a micro loop. A micro loop is one that you, your, your keyboard's not working. You can press, you know, like the shift key and it doesn't light up. Uh, yeah, it, so it's not getting back out to the kernel at all. It's just, it's just spinning inside of the driver. The only way out is usually you have to hard reset the box, and that's what I had to do. And it turned out that I was running a video. I was watching a video, and of course there's a lot of things that are open then. But the thing it was looping up on was a piece, a segment of audio. So that leads me to think, ah, pipe wire. But I don't know. I haven't looked at all the logs yet. So I'm not saying this is a bug. Uh, I'm. It's a feature. Not definitely. It's a feature. But you should be able to unplug a laptop. And it should pause for a moment, reclock, and then everything should take off. It shouldn't get locked into a spin, into, you know, a spin cycle. So all in all, uh, I think that this release has some really good things to offer. 
Um, and yeah, I don't know when they'll they'll have this release. Usually, two months is usually about right from the time. And Release Candidate Three just came out, so yeah. So there there may be a four. There may not be. They vote on this every time they get to the end of their cycle of testing with the particular release candidate they're on. They make a decision as a group. Does this is this good to go? Can we finalize this? Or do we need another release candidate? And so they'll make those decisions uh, as they come up to them. So how many there will be? Yeah, there will be as many as needed. <laughs> That's all I can say. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again soon. Bye for now.